Episode 11, Finding Your Blue Ocean, The Art of War, Mitch's Mailbag, and Stuffed Mushrooms. Stick around! Welcome to Business Edge Radio, the show that gives you tips, tricks, tools, and techniques about how to build a more profitable business, while at the same time creating your perfect lifestyle. It's a show about working less and living more. A few golden nuggets, a little bit of wisdom, and over 35 years of business experience to help you keep your edge. Lifestyle entrepreneur, best-selling author, internationally renowned business speaker, and daddy of three, Mitch Graff brings the heat with actionable techniques for building the business and lifestyle of your dreams. Now your host, Mitch Graff. What is happening, Unleashed Tribe? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Business Edge Radio, the ultimate brainstorming session for your business and your life. I am your strikingly good-looking and handsome host, Mitch Graff, at least according to my six-year-old daughter. And on today's show, we have a wide-ranging discussion with Tom Hoffert, who is the executive director for the Salem Chamber of Commerce in Salem, Oregon. We are also going to be discussing ways that you can create some space between you and all of your competitors. I have a review of a book about war. Yes, war, but not in the sense that you are thinking. Plus, we dig into the mailbag to answer some of your most burning questions. And of course, we put the virtual cherry on top of this episode with Cooking Corner with Mitch. And today, we're going to be making a nice little appetizer, or as I like to call them, appetizers, because it just teases your appetite. We're going to be making a tasty artichoke heart, sun-dried tomato, and feta cheese stuffed mushroom. So you will want to stick around for that. When it comes to branding your business, you have two choices. Have a business that offers the same products, the same services, the same everything as all your competitors, or you can figure out a way to develop a niche where there is extraordinarily little or no competition. This is called finding some blue ocean somewhere in the world. Now, we discussed this topic briefly a few episodes ago, but I want to really get into the nitty gritty today. You may already be aware of the terms red ocean and blue ocean, which were coined by professors Chan Kim and Renee Maborn through their international best-selling book, Blue Ocean Strategy. Basically, a market that is full of competitors is known as the red ocean because all that competition turns the ocean a blood red. If you are already a business owner in today's business world, you may have been trying to figure out what you can do to blast through your competition. However, do you really want to operate in that highly competitive ocean, or would you rather figure out a way to be a pioneer in an ever-expanding blue ocean. The hard part is dealing with all the copycats that seem to come out of the woodwork and take advantage of the mistakes that you've already made, your ideas, your strategies. In other words, they can force you back into a red ocean, especially in this high-tech internet world that we live in today. But what can you do if you are in blue water and it starts turning red slowly? It is possible to stay in the blue water and grow a profitable business, but first, let's look at the differences between the red and the blue oceans. Number one, in a red ocean, the competition already exists, whereas in a blue ocean, you can create an unchallenged market space. Number two, the strategy in a red ocean is to beat the competition, whereas in blue water, you make the competition completely irrelevant. Number three, The competition may have an advantage in the red ocean, but the blue ocean requires innovation and value. Number four, the red ocean has existing customers already. The blue ocean attracts new customers. And number five, existing demand is exploited in red oceans, whereas in a blue ocean, new demand is created. So how do you survive in a red ocean? Entrepreneurs and business leaders are constantly creating competitive strategies for red oceans. They go head to head with their competition, day in, day out, over the same consumer markets. All of them are doing the exact same thing, but trying to compete on, guess what, price. You will never win that battle. That I know for sure. Let's take a quick look at fast food chains like McDonald's, Burger King, Arby's, Wendy's, Taco Bell. To survive, They've had to offer more items, install faster ordering systems, 
and cater to those interested in eating healthier meals. I can't remember the last time I saw a fast food chain that didn't have a $1 value menu somewhere displayed on the premises. The increased competition turns the water red, fighting for more profit and growth, meaning the pressure to lower prices becomes immense. In the blue ocean, demand for your services and products is created rather than waging war against your competition. There is plenty of opportunity for growth, and blue oceans can be created in two ways. First, you can create a brand new industry. For example, when Netflix first came out, nobody really had heard of watching a movie or a show on demand streaming on the internet. I can remember even before that when I used to get actual DVDs in the mail every week. This is before the internet as we know it today blew up. We used to have to wait an entire year to watch The Grinch or It's a Wonderful Life on TV or watch reruns of Friends. Now, at the touch of a button, we can watch just about every show ever created. If you've noticed, Netflix now has a red ocean of competition. Everybody has a streaming service just like Netflix. So what did Netflix do a few years back? They began creating original content which kept them a step ahead of the competition. They created Blue Waters once again for a short period of time. Well, now Google and Apple and Disney, among others, have jumped into that crowded space, and the blue ocean is once again turning red. I am sure someone will come up with an innovation to the industry that will make the competition irrelevant for a short period of time. Then the cycle will begin all over again. Now you're even hearing rumblings that we may be able to watch a brand new movie on our own TV in the comfort of our own home without ever having to leave the house. That would indeed be an innovation that would flip the industry on its head. I, for one, really enjoy getting that big, huge, unlimited-sized popcorn, refilling it once for free, and sitting in the front row so the sound makes my entire body just start vibrating. There was a study recently that showed that over 80% of Americans would be happy to pay a premium price for a brand spanking new movie that could be played at their home. Stay tuned in the industry for sure. Or second, create a blue ocean within a red ocean. And this can occur when a company changes the limitations of an existing industry. A good example is in the saturated fitness industry with a company called Curves. Started back about 25 years ago, Curves changed fitness for women by offering studio fitness workouts at a low price. The workouts last for 30 minutes, and you have a coach during each session, as well as other support members that you need in order to achieve your health and fitness goals. At the time, nobody else was offering a product or service that competed with them. All right, so here's a few tips for how you can find and stay in blue water. Number one, you have to offer benefits that your competitors consider unnecessary or overly unique. It might be something that contributes to a cleaner environment, offers a unique purpose, or a style that is distinctive, exclusive, rare, or irreplaceable. Something that is not already being done. This is a great exercise for your back deck with a good cup of coffee. Number two, Create a total solution for buyers who are purchasing a product or service from you. A good way to do this is to consider what goes on before, during, and after the sale has been completed. Let's say that you own a nursery that sells vegetable starters for gardens. Tomatoes and cucumbers and beans and peas and pumpkins and corn and onions, all of them. Well, what do people need before they put starters into the ground? Well, they'll need good soil. They'll need a planter or a box to put the starters in. They'll need gloves, knee guards, among other items. What about things they could potentially need after the starters are planted? Well, they're going to need fertilizer pellets. They're going to need hoses for watering, weed killers, snail killers, and so on. You could offer a complete vegetable starting kit, so to speak, which will not only generate additional revenues, it will also build a loyal customer base that knows you offer them a complete solution for their gardening needs. Another idea, you could offer many seminars on weekends for customers to learn about what veggies do best in your area and what types of soils are best for different types of plants. I hope you're getting the point here. Number three, create a new allure or interest in an existing product. I can remember when fidget spinners were all the rage a few years ago. 
You saw them everywhere. And they all were kind of the same, if I remember correctly. Then they started getting smart and making them with fancy colored lights and sounds and different shapes. And because of that, it extended the rage another season or two. Number four, create a high value at a low cost. A good example of this is Southwest Airlines and JetBlue, who appeal to people who were used to driving or are used to driving to their destinations rather than flying. In other words, they made flying affordable. Strip away any unnecessary costs. Anything that doesn't contribute or create value gets reduced or completely eliminated. No free meals, no free checked bags, etc. Give the customer the absolute lowest price, no frills, no benefits. As you can see, the concept of a red and blue ocean is much easier to understand if you look at real world examples that exist today of how businesses have branded themselves then continue to rebrand themselves. Most industries are operating in red oceans with defined competitors, with specific ways to run their businesses in a defined market. It is best described as shark infested water where all the sharks are fighting for the same prey. You must take time to evaluate whether you need to rethink your business strategies and branding in order to create a blue ocean for your business. This is fun and challenging all at the same time. If you are spending all of your time fighting for a piece of limited sales, then you're in the red ocean and you need to stop right now. <laughs> you are probably constantly competing with your competitors just to increase your market share as your business becomes more competitive and aggressive with more and more competitors coming in every day. Profits are likely to diminish as well and eventually you'll just be out of business. When companies compete for the same customers with the same products, features, benefits, everything, the result is a pricing war and you will always end up the loser in that scenario, guaranteed. Just remember that once you are successful in blue water, other companies will be attracted to you and quickly change your blue space to red. When this occurs, and I bet your bottom dollar that it will, you must differentiate yourself. And saying that you're the original doesn't work anymore. You may be forced to customize your product even more or offer other services to keep yourself in that blue water, but it will be totally worth it. Innovate, innovate, innovate. Always, always, always. Here's my email address. Use the email. Email. We get your mail. We get your mail. Let's dive in to Mitch's mailbag and answer some of your burning questions. Well, I have to say that even though the show's only been going about six weeks, the amount of emails we've been getting has been absolutely tremendous, and we're loving it. Keep it coming. And I thought it would be helpful if I answered a few questions each week that we are getting from our listeners. So let's see what's in the mailbag today. First of all, this is from Renee in Santa Monica. Beautiful city, the best sushi bars. And she says... I've wanted to start my own business for many years, but have been too afraid to try. And now that I have the resources of time and money to be able to do it, I'm worried that I may have missed the boat. How do you feel about starting a new business in the clothing industry? Well, first of all, congratulations for having the guts and the vision to even want to try. It does take a very special person to be your own boss. But to your point, Renee, it's never too late to launch your idea and to go after your dreams. And it doesn't matter if you're in the clothing industry or dog grooming industry, have an internet marketing company or anything else. It doesn't matter. Most people that have a passion for something, they call it a hobby. And that's as far as it ever will get. And that's totally fine. But for the chosen few who want to make that passion and take it and turn it into a living and a breathing, living organism... You've been given a higher calling, and it sounds like you might be one of those chosen few, Renee. And I don't know about your financial situation enough to give more thoughts on what your next step should be. But what I do know is that if you don't give this a try, you may have regrets down the road. And that's not a good thing. That's not to say that you need to go all in from the start. Any risks that you take should be measured risks, meaning that you limit the downside potential. 
But sitting down and doing what I call popcorning your ideas onto a piece of paper is the first step. If you've already done that, then I recommend you have a conversation with your banker or a business advisor to discuss the financial side of things. Hey, starting a business is like eating an elephant. You do it one bite at a time. You can't eat it all at once. So just because you decide to go to the next rung on the ladder, so to speak, doesn't mean that you were deciding to go all in. Do it in steps. Keep your passions going, Renee. And you may find out that you have just been a dormant entrepreneur for all these years and you didn't even know it. All right. This email comes from Sam and Val in Toronto, Canada. Hey, Mitch, loving your show up here in the Great White North. We've shared your show with several friends of ours and am stoked about a business concept that we have. I haven't heard that word stoked in a long time. (laughs) We've been married 24 years and have never worked together before. We have an idea for a business that would require both of us in order to be successful. I'm a long haul truck driver and my wife is an office manager for a local insurance agent. Our idea is to start this on the side and see how it goes before we do anything foolish like quit our jobs. (laughs) Well, that's good. My question is this, do you recommend married couples working together? Man, that's a loaded question. I'm not sure if I wanna challenge this one. Uh, First of all, thanks for sharing the love up in the Great White North. I really appreciate it. Well, speaking from the perspective of both an entrepreneur and a husband, I can say a couple of things. It's great that you both want to work together, but it's going to be vitally important that you lay down some rules and some guidelines right from the get-go, which is going to save you both a lot of headaches down the road. First of all, you need to make sure that you guys divide and conquer when it comes to the responsibilities of the business. Make a list of all the job duties, and maybe you've already done this. It's going to be required in order to get this concept launched, and I don't know what the concept is, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Then you guys can select which duties are in your column. It's kind of like picking teams for dodgeball when you were in school. Remember that? (laughs) You don't want to be doing the same thing, so it's important that you separate the duties between you and your spouse. Hopefully your superpowers and your skill sets are different, which will make this task go much smoother. If you have a strength for, let's just say networking or getting up in front of people, giving talks, and your spouse doesn't, well, it makes it pretty easy to decide. Over the years, I've had my mom work for me, my stepfather work for me, and now my wife and I have been working together for Well, the better part of 20 years, 22 years, and I can honestly say that each time the skill sets that they possessed versus my skill sets were very, very different, or they were just tasks that I didn't like doing. Uh, And that also is going to help. If if one of you likes to do the networking and the other one doesn't, that makes it very, very simple. So make sure that you both have a clear picture of what your roles are and that there isn't much crossover. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of wasted time and energy. And at the beginning, you don't want that to happen. Your time is very precious, and you need to make sure that you are maximizing that time and the duties and the tasks that you spend your time on and that you are as efficient as possible. And second, I think even more importantly, you need to make sure that when your work is done at X o'clock, that you actually step across that virtual line in your home and more importantly in your mind, and leave the work behind. Let's say that you were done at 5 p.m. Well, at 5.01, you need to be done. I mean done. No conversations over dinner about what uh, the day was. Go ahead and debrief, but as far as talking about work, you need to be done with that. It's time to spend time together as a husband and wife, as friends. You need to have time for your children. Very important. In fact, probably one of the most important. Uh, Time to water your garden or have an adult beverage. Time just to do your life. (laughs) Right from the get-go, you need to make sure that your lifestyle goals are defined, your boundaries are established, and that your time is allocated for work and then non-work activities. It's challenging to find that right perfect balance, but trust me when I say it will pay off in spades down the road. Trust me, I've tried to live my version of a 24-7 lifestyle for the better part of 30 years. 
And to me, that doesn't mean 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My definition is 24 hours a week, seven months a year. And I'm not successful with that all the time, but that's always in the forefront of my mind and in my decisions. Like if I'm going to do a new project, start a new business, buy a business, how much time is it going to take? Can I offload some of those responsibilities? And can I make sure that my lifestyle, my personal choices I have for my lifestyle, are they smack dab in the middle of all these goals and objectives for my new activity? Sam and Val, just make sure that you have clearly defined roles and make sure that when it's time to be done, you learn how to switch gears. This is a skill that you will absolutely have to have right from the beginning. Good luck with it and keep me in the loop. And I love getting emails. And if you like to send us your thoughts and your questions, please send them to info at powermarketing101.com. That's info at Power Marketing 101, and that's the numbers 101.com. And perhaps you will have your question read on a future show. Well, typically, my interviews are with what I would call for profit individuals who are working diligently to generate revenues for their enterprises. But today, we're going to take a little different path. My interview today is with a gentleman who may work for the Chamber of Commerce, but his ideas and leadership concepts should be adopted all around the globe, and not only chambers, but in the private sector as well. Today we chat with Tom Hofford, who's the Executive Director for the Salem Area Chamber of Commerce, located in Oregon's capital city of Salem, and prior to his position as the top dog at the Chamber, speaking of dogs, he takes his dog Lacey just about everywhere. <laughs> He worked in the private sector for Don Poncho Mexican Foods, which is a national craft baking company, where he led the innovations and new product development efforts, working with companies like Taco Bell, Chipotle Mexican Grill, Whole Foods Market, and Subway. Tom's strategic vision and commitment to relevancy has changed the organization's trajectory over the past 18 months, and he centers everything on what he calls the three C's, which are convener, catalyst, and champion. The Salem Chamber has reset its growth strategy towards supporting the Chamber's small businesses and sharing their untold stories of success. We dive into subjects of leadership, mentorship, and servantship, as well as a little side trip into the wonderful sport of lacrosse. You know, as business owners, we sometimes only think about how to generate profits, sell more products, get more accounts, and take on more headaches in order to achieve success. Well, the approach you are going to hear today is a little different to what you may be used to hearing from an entrepreneurial mind. To Tom, it's about serving, serving the needs of the business community, serving his fantastic board of directors, serving the needs of other local nonprofits. And through these efforts, his organization has not only kept its relevancy, but has seen organic growth that any for-profit business would be envious of. With that... Let's dive into our wide-ranging conversation with Tom Hoffert. Well, Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mitch, for having me. Great to be here. Oh, it's an honor to have you, bud. Hey, you're probably one of the most high-profile people that there is in the Salem, Oregon business community, being the executive director for the local Chamber of Commerce. And Salem is where the state capital is for the state of Oregon. But there's something about you that is very intriguing to me, and I want to know about your love affair with the sport of lacrosse. Besides your day gig, you are also the president of the Oregon Lacrosse Officials Association. How did that come about? <laughs> uh, I had the opportunity. I, I grew up playing uh, junior hockey, uh, ice hockey. And uh, when I went to undergrad at Western Oregon University, there was a group of individuals putting a lacrosse team together for kind of that small university. And they said, well, you play hockey, so you must know how to play lacrosse. So <laughs> Basically, my freshman year of, of school, I had the opportunity to pick up uh, a lacrosse stick uh, in earnest and then played some uh, club lacrosse for a very small school here uh, in, a, in a small community outside of the Salem area. I had been an official uh, in hockey for a number of years, including actually since I was quite young. My father was an official of basketball, so I kind of grew up in an officiating family and uh, many years later, when lacrosse uh, got started in earnest in the Salem area, 
they obviously needed officials. And so I got brought in by a couple of my peers and that was a lot of years ago. And uh, <laughs> so from starting on youth lacrosse fields and working my way up through high school and then ultimately onto college, semi-pro and professional ball, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of lacrosse. So great. Great side uh, side hustle, as the young people would say. <laughs> side hustle, yeah. Well, I remember a couple, two, three years ago when the Syracuse Orange women team came out here and mm-hmm. uh, and played in the state of Oregon. That was kind of a big deal for our state. But, you know, there's a there's kind of a challenge that lacrosse has, not just in Oregon, but I think in a lot of the, the, the western states. It's, it's having a hard time gaining popularity within the schools. It's been kind of through a bit of a rebrand, I'd say, the last few years, which is similar to what many businesses are kind of going through right now. They're looking for ways to you know, grow revenue and create new innovations, uh, refine what it means to offer impeccable service. What is it in your quiver of skill sets that makes you get excited about taking something, whether it be a sport like lacrosse or a chamber of commerce, and giving it a new look and feel? Sure. Well, I think one important thing, and those two are certainly a little bit unique, but it always comes back to me with connecting with individuals who want to see great outcomes in the communities we serve. So uh, for me, when you uh, age out in sports, lacrosse is not a sport like golf or tennis or pickleball that you can play uh, your entire, you certainly can play late into your later years, but not with the physical prowess you might have had. (laughs) Describe pickleball to me. I'm sorry for my ignorance, but what is pickleball? Oh, uh, kind of pretty popular court game uh, that's played traditionally on a about half the size of a court of a tennis court, but very popular right now. Uh, I'm glad I'm bringing something new to you, Mitch. Uh, exactly. This may be a sport you want to get involved with. <laughs> so there's no actual pickles involved with this? No pickles. Oh, I don't know how it got its name. I've only played it uh, a handful of times, but it is an absolute <laughs> hoot. As I was saying about looking at, you know, kind of why we get involved with what we get involved with. For me, I want to surround myself with leaders and individuals who really believe in when we gather together, we can create pretty powerful results. And so uh, in the lacrosse community, it was the opportunity for me to continue to serve in a game that I loved as a, as a very low end player, but high passion for the sport. I was able to transfer that passion into uh, becoming uh, a pretty skilled individual as an official in the men's game. And similar in a chamber of commerce uh, coming out of a 15-year private sector career, I I wanted to join an organization that is linking people together and creating great results for the communities we serve. So for me, it is that passion bucket of how do we put uh, leaders and developing leaders into a situation where they're going to be able to thrive and uh, have great influence as well as develop their next generation of leadership. So when you ask why I serve in the and the role of president for the lacrosse officials and why I serve for U.S. lacrosse in that same capacity for the Pacific Northwest, it's to create the next generation of great leaders in the sport. You know, that's the same thing you're actually kind of doing with, uh, with the Chamber of Commerce as well, right? Trying to breed future leaders to come in and, and step into leadership roles on committees or out there in the community, or just to just to uh, basically be a little more op- um, noticeable in the business community. Yeah, we're lean and mean. I mean, we are a staff of nine skilled individuals, uh, five of which are very very focused on workforce development and partnership with the Salem Kaiser School District, and the remaining four individuals. Uh, you know, most chambers of commerce our size would probably have staffs a little bit larger than we do, and So we really are, uh, we take a sniper's mentality and we stay very, very focused on our mission and try and really drive value back, not just to our investors, but to the entire business community. As a volunteer membership organization, nobody is required to invest with us, pay a membership due, invest in our events, anything. That is done through the goodwill of business and believing in the mission uh, that we provide in our community. And we, we rely on a simple statement. It is this, we believe in helping businesses prosper so our entire community may thrive. And we look at a macro view like that, you notice nowhere in there does it say we're only serving the needs of our members. We are serving the needs of the entire business community, and we hope that people see that value and then link arms with us as a member 
when the, when the time is right for their business. But we're fighting every day for the small business owners in this city and beyond and pretty proud to do it. Every single day. So when you took over in, I think it was January of 2019, the chamber was going through a bit of a rebrand of its own. On that very first day that you stepped into your new office, what was the very first thing that you did? Well, for me, everything is about uh, communication and relationships. So my first order of business, uh, probably much like most of the individuals who would be listening to a leadership podcast of this caliber, would be to connect with, with your peers first internally. So first item of business was an 8 a.m. staff meeting with uh, all our team members. And then, of course, over the next few months, it was getting very in tune with key shareholders from our volunteer board of directors, our volunteer committee members, and then ultimately out to our entire membership. I, I really feel strongly that an organization, we're a nonprofit organization, we need to be doing uh, and reflective of the needs of our membership every day. So our mission, no, no two days are the same at the Salem Chamber, but the mission never changes. Let's drive value back for those businesses in our community. Uh, allow them to be operating their business in a place where economic stability, paychecks, jobs are valued, and then really create that local connection for the community as a whole to know that when they invest with local companies, those dollars are kept in our, in our city and reinvested through taxation, paychecks to employees, all of our nonprofit support uh, for the various entities that depend on uh, business support, be it, you know, your little league sponsorships or sponsoring a soccer team or involvement in, in churches and the like, and really making sure that if the solid economic foundation of our city is on firm ground, that is, small businesses are thriving, we know that the entire community will be in a situation to also thrive because of the support the business gives, not just the tax base, but the entire ecosystem that, a commu- that makes a community healthy. Right. You know, and as you're talking, you're, you're using words like uh, stakeholders and members, but you know what? You can easily just change those words out for the word customer. And so a lot of small businesses out there, it's the same thing. You're trying to serve your customers. You're trying to make sure that you're doing everything you can to serve that customer, making sure that their needs are met. And I call it the six-star experience. Give a little bit extra, that impeccable service. And you're trying to do the same thing for your 1,000 plus business owners. You know, on a daily basis, you're talking to those business owners and you're talking to local and state national politicians on a regular basis, not to mention keeping your staff at the chamber fired and and, uh, on task all the time. Lots of people look to you for support or encouragement or for answers to the tough questions. Where do you go for your support and encouragement and, and who do you look up to? Sure. Well, I, I'm, I'm a really big believer in mentorship. I don't know about you, Mitch. I'm sure we could have a great conversation on what mentorship means. I was very fortunate to grow up uh, playing team sports and having the chance to be around uh, of people who really drove a lot of positive experiences back to me and diver- what, I, what I always call diversity of programming. So I, I think it's important. I, number one, I'm a big reader. Um, I really like to to know what is going on uh, on all demographics, be it age, ethnicity. I I like to know what our different business owners are facing, not just as the business themselves, but at the individuals behind them, because it's gonna really help us focus on what's gonna drive content that that is gonna resonate with them. So the customer experience is about creating a very personalized attachment and connection point with your consumer, with your customer. And, you know, we don't want to be seen as operating in a big box, you know, widget world. We are a very relevant, we feel we're a very relevant chamber due to uh, how closely tied we are with the voice of our businesses themselves. So that occurs in a lot of different fashions for me, where we're, you know, connecting through surveys. And, and I, quite frankly, I love just getting out on the street and being in our businesses. But to the reflection on men, on mentorship, I have a group of peers uh, that I rely on, and there's a, quite quite honestly a few different groups that I like to touch base with. Mitch, our board of directors are not just a group of committed individuals who want to see the business community succeed, but they want to see individuals succeed. And to have somebody come into a nonprofit world after 15 years in private sector, there there is a very common and healthy understanding that. 
you're not in this line of work to uh, make a big paycheck. You're in this line of work to have a positive influence on your community. That trust and, and back and forth between myself and our board is very healthy. They understand that the reason I am here is to serve in what I call servant leadership and to bring those around me up and help encourage businesses to be successful. So I rely on them as mentors. I have a group of, of what I would call both friends and mentors that I gather with regularly, including a few individuals you certainly know that, you know, the, the trust cycle is the ability to pull down the walls and talk in real honest terms. And so when I get in those situations with my mentors, I'm able to have what I would consider safe and open conversations, knowing that they are going to remain within the group and really hear direct feedback on issues that I may be facing, things I would like to hear different perspectives on. And then the task of all leaders is really to take all that information and put it into the best form that's going to create a product that's going to have an impact in the community you serve. So while, I, well, while we're certainly going to have failures, I never fear failures. What I fear is a lack of effort. And that's right. this organization will never be uh, ever seen as lackadaisical or throwing their legs up and sitting by and watching things occur. We're initiators and we are not afraid to have something that doesn't go quite as smooth as we like. We're afraid to not have taken the chance to do it. Yeah. And obviously, Tom, just listening to you, you have the chops to do just about anything in the business world that you would want as an entrepreneur. And I surmise that if you had your own businesses, you would be at the top of the food chain, you know, lickety split. But you, you mentioned it yourself. You have a, a servant heart and it's a higher calling, I think. And you're in the role of serving your, your business community. Do you think you're ever going to hang out a shingle on your own? Oh, that's a great question and something I'm certainly uh, certainly asked about from occasion. I mean, I had, you know, I've been, and this is, again, just on human experience and what you go through. I never had the opportunity to uh, have a wife and kids, Mitch. So I have I live a little bit different uh, kind of view, and everybody's going to have their different take who's listening to this. But I've never once worked a day uh, for money. I, I work in things that I'm passionate about and and work on causes that uh, fill me up if I'm seeing other people filled up. And so regardless of where that may be, if it's in nonprofit work or starting my own company or or like I did uh, with my previous employer, 15 great years and for, for a family-owned business, uh, my motivation is always going to be to leave an impact and help create something that is hopefully bigger than ourselves and positive for a community. So but I see myself back in the private sector, certainly. Uh, would my ethics or, or anything that I believe in to do that ever change? Absolutely not. <laughs> Did you have a, a kid business when you were younger? Uh, no, you know, I, I came, I was very fortunate to work for my grandfather owned a small sporting goods store in downtown Salem. In fact, if you're ever at Taproot, a great restaurant downtown, that formerly was a, believe it or not, a sporting goods store with two stories. Back in the day. Uh, so I grew up. Yeah, I grew up in a small business, uh, working stocking shelves for my grandfather. From there, uh, at the age of 15, I was fortunate to be hired at a local grocery store and uh, worked there, in fact, all the way uh, until I turned 21. And when I turned 21, I was uh, still in, in college, and I went to bartending. So, you know, for me, <laughs> I wanted to do that, That's the perfect job that, for leadership. I mean, that way you get to learn human nature. You get to learn about how to deal with all kinds of personalities. That's the perfect job for leadership. <laughs> I, I love that experience. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, both my parents are retired school teachers. So it was incumbent on me to provide a little bit, well, not just a little, a lot for myself uh, and to try and minimize college debt. So I was looking for ways to be an entrepreneurial in my own, <laughs> own way. And I found that bartending was, you know, a lot of hard work. And when everybody would be out and having fun with their friends, I was taking home 150 bucks a night <laughs> and getting home at three. But I I was able to pay my car payments. That's and, right. And my, my apartment <laughs> rent. <laughs> oh, man. You know, small businesses, not just in Oregon, but all across the country, there's a vast plethora of daunting challenges, even in good times. I mean, when things are great, 95 out of 100 businesses go away within five years. In your mm -hmm. opinion, what is the one most important thing 
that a either a new business owner or an old time business owner can do to exponentially increase their chances of success. I mean, you deal with people all the time. What's the common thread that ties the successful brands together? Well, I think if you're going to open books, they're going to tell you a sound strategic plan and this and that, and we could go through yeah, that. Yeah, let's get beyond that. <laughs> academic side. I'd argue it comes back to people. And if you motivate and have, whether you're a one-person shop a five-person shop, or or God willing, you, you grow your business up into 20s and 30s or even hundreds of employees. The common theme that I see in successful businesses is extremely high-performing individuals within the company that match their own personal ethos. It's very hard to take personalities that are not built for business and ask them to be high performers in business. I believe entrepreneurship is a personality trait as much it is, as it is an ambition. And so surrounding yourself with individuals who have that type of core value system where we'll never be outworked, we're, we're here for the long haul, we believe in a vision, and we believe in leadership that will bring us to that vision, that type of aspirational leadership and, and relationships with people I've seen have the highest results long term mm -hmm. because the burnout rate is lower. You have individuals who are all seeing the same vision and, and quest uh, on where they want to go. And it suddenly becomes a lot less like work and a lot more like a challenging puzzle that you want to conquer together. Well, and, and another dynamic that's something that's just now happening in our economy is a lot of people are working remotely. And mm -hmm. I've noticed this, the people that I know and talk to, that some of them are excelling with this format. They look forward to getting up in their own home and having a cup of coffee and stepping across that virtual line and going to work. And they are performing at that high level like you're talking about. But there's also a segment of people that don't do well in that. They need that, that social interaction. They need that boss over their shoulder, so to speak, saying, hey, stick to it. Let's get this done. And so there's almost like two separate halves happening right now in the same country. And some people are going to come out of this thriving beyond any of their wildest dreams. And other people are going to unfortunately probably get pushed aside and end up in a different industry. But it's interesting to see some people perform well and some people don't perform. Yeah, the, the, the dynamic and something I've written about um, a few times and published is the dynamic between the casualties and the champions. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it comes down to who is poised to absorb and pivot versus those who are handed a tough deck of cards and they don't have the ability either due to the business that they're in or the mindset that they have within that business that they cannot pivot to something that is going to drive them towards greater relevance. Small businesses, that engine and that passion um, and boy, I'll tell you, Mitch, I loved it for 15 years being on that, just what we call the bleeding end of just trying to always be next and first to market. That's a mindset and surrounding yourself with a team that is embracing that type of attitude and willingness to try uh, new things that maybe feel a little uncomfortable. I, I mean, a full credit to our, these coming generations. They never knew what it was like to be working eight to five, Mitch. I mean, I can't remember. Could you remember the last time you worked <laughs> eight to five? I mean, eight to five is, we're seeing that in a few places still. You're going to see that maybe in banks, although that's changing greatly. You see it on the, on the public employee side, maybe uh, due to, you know, certain workforces that have an eight to five. There isn't an entrepreneur listening to this podcast, I bet, that is sitting there going, yeah, I work in eight to five. It's just not built into the realities of how the, the, the market is a 24-hour day market. How could we possibly think we're going to be working at a desk eight to five? It's changed. We are going to be, like you said, we're going to sip our coffee in the morning and maybe part of our day is on Zoom calls or, or on a digital format. And then part of our day may be peer to peer with a coworker or maybe a customer. But that, that incredible opportunity for the market to pivot and have a 24 hour market due to technology, I, I love that. I mean, that's the stuff that, that really gets me going. That gets you going. And yeah. You're not doing a podcast like this if you don't 
don't love that type of uh, <laughs> dynamic uh, work environment as well. Cut from the same cloth. You said the word innovate, and your previous job was in innovation for a company called Don Poncho, and you've taken some of that innovative mindset that you were talking about, and you've implemented it into the chamber. What's next for the chamber? I mean, obviously, chamber of commerces are all over the country, and they all kind of exist the same way. They do the same thing with memberships. They have greeters. They have all the same elements of what a membership entails. What are you doing for the future for the chamber that's going to be on that bleeding edge, kind of the innovative edge? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, to me, I actually would push back a little that. I, I think that if you see one chamber, you've seen one chamber. They're all so very different. Yeah, point and, taken, point taken. <laughs> and I think that some, the chambers that have found success have found ways to provide value to the entire business community, not just their members, and then allow the, the strength of programming, uh, the foundational beliefs of advocacy for the small business owner and employee. And by the way, the small business owner and employee need, can never be separated because they are one. It is the, the owner is taking on the ultimate risk, but without the support of the employee base, uh, I, I think it's very challenging to just talk in the terms of owners of businesses. We, we are interconnected with our workforces. And, you're, and you're, platform, you're correct, Tom, because there are a lot of chambers that, like you say, if you've seen one, you've seen one. There is something unique and special about the Salem Area Chamber of Commerce. And I have to agree with you because I am part of that chamber along with several other chambers, but there is something special. There is that special branding that has been done to kind of separate them. And I think that a lot of that is because of your efforts and your ingenuity and your innovative thinking, but it is a special feeling amongst chamber members. They feel like they belong. They feel like they have taken ownership. You know, they all are owners in this living, growing being that is the Salem Chamber of Commerce. And I think a lot of that is because of your leadership. Well, I, certainly, you know, I, I play a small part. I, I give a lot of credit to the, the a board of directors willing to uh, to look at a flashpoint moment where you had mentioned to start off the podcast that the chamber had come out of uh, some different times. I mean, there had been a lot of turnover in the office of the chamber. Uh, there had been, you know, just some general typecasting of the chamber as a as a right-wing uh, advocacy organization with no community connection. Oftentimes, organizations will take on a bit of the personality of the leader. I, I would say that our organization has taken on the, the personality of our entire board of directors. That's a diverse group of individuals in age, ethnicity, experience, industry. You gotta create that melting pot where individuals who want to be in an organization that is very uh, progressive on how they look at how businesses ought to be supported, uh, the role that the city and government and county government and state government play in those businesses are, are being influenced uh, by the voice of small business. For me, the innovation that, you, that we have been really working on continues to be on catered communication to the needs of the individual. So I'll give you an example. There are, we have over uh, about, we're all, well over a thousand members. I think we're at a, a thousand and twenty-one members. So it feels good to know we have some great support. We represent 40,000 employees in our city. There are business owners who would never have the opportunity nor time and quite frankly, some of them nor the interest on attending a weekly greeters or networking meeting. We are not serving our members well to know that that individual doesn't, we know they don't want to attend to greeters. They've indicated their, their passion is public policy. Why would we be sending them information on the next greeters event? It's tone deaf. So we have catered our communication to our members based on the interests they have shared that they have with us. What is required are, are and this is a, a important thing that I think dynamic chambers will be looking to do in the years ahead is what it, what it causes is we need to know each of the individuals in those companies who want to be involved and what their passion is. So we have passion buckets, as we call them, such as workforce development, business advocacy, uh, connecting and learning, uh, a passion bucket for, uh, for, for visibility and marketing. 
we want to communicate with our members how they wish to be communicated. Some, we have members who still prefer receiving print in their mailbox. We have others that would never open up a piece of mail from us uh, short of a billing cycle or the like. <laughs> so tailored communication, that concierge service, uh, based on what they've shared with us that they want to hear about is an important part of being relevant. Concierge service, be- just like when you get a, a Platinum American Express card, you get a concierge assigned to your account. I love that. See, right, well, th- right there is the secret <laughs> sauce, Tom. Right there is what separates and what innovates the Salem Chamber. That's next level stuff, what you're talking about. Strategic marketing, laser beam marketing, as opposed to shotgun marketing, going after each member individually what turns them on, what are their needs, identify it, log in it, and then executing on that plan. I love that. Well, I think it's 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 going to be something you're, and, and here's the positive, Mitch. You're going to see a lot more of this as companies become more savvy. I, I don't think this is going to be unique to nonprofits or chambers, certainly. I've seen it in how companies that I invest in or purchase products from on how they communicate with me mm-hmm. uh, from both national and local companies. So this is just, I, I think we do a podcast like this to give people uh, carrots on on smart on smart game planning. And if you're listening to this and you're thinking, how do I best communicate with my customer? You got to realize not everybody is finding Facebook as the marketing portal they want to engage in. So you have to be very dynamic on how you communicate with your members. And if you have the ability to segment out your membership or your customers, we'll use that word. If you have the ability to segment out your customer base, knowing what their uh, hot spots are, you're going to put yourself much more ahead so your content is actually digested, understood, and received rather than just uh, the last thing a Chamber of Commerce wants. I mean, the catastrophic day for me, Mitch, is sending an email to somebody and they don't even open it and read it. And it's like, oh, another Chamber email, delete. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's lessons there for small businesses, medium businesses, large businesses alike. You know, the, the lessons of taking what you have, laser beam, focusing it to your new prospects, your existing customers, whoever you're trying to target to generate your revenue streams. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're nonprofit or for profit. You're all trying to serve the customer to the best of your ability. Hey, Tom, give us a, a hobby that people may not know about. I know you love your dog, and your dog goes a lot of places with you. <laughs> Sitting right next to me right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. You did some pretty important meetings. I've seen that dog with you. But tell me something that people may not know about you. I mean, lacrosse certainly takes— That uh, yeah, doesn't count. Pretty... We already know about that. Give me something that <laughs> nobody knows. Okay. Um I would say I'm an amateur. Uh, I've got a pretty extensive little uh, bourbon collection, uh, rare bourbons. Uh, nice. So uh, certainly not anything you would ever do in quantity with uh, with the collection, but nice sipping bourbons. Uh, I absolutely love uh, fly fishing on the Metolius River. Boy, just being out with my friends on a boat. A pretty simple life, Mitch. Uh, I think the best <laughs> part of life is connecting with people and uh, surrounding yourself with people who inspire you to be better each and every day. So uh, not too many hidden hobbies, to be honest with you. About 20 years ago, I was enjoying a single malt scotch with a friend of mine, and he opened up this a bottle, and he told me the story behind it. And I had a little sip, and he said, okay, 25 bucks. 25 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that you just slow down your life just a little bit and enjoy the moment, whether you be on a, a fly fishing river sit on the back deck with friends on the golf course or in a board of directors meeting for the Salem Chamber of Commerce. Well, Tom, thank you so much for spending the time. I know you're a busy man, but thanks for giving us a little bit of behind the scenes of your thought process and what gets you excited. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity, Mitch. Thank you for doing this programming. What an inspirational discussion with one of our true forward thinkers. My biggest takeaway, if we can change our mindset from how do we make more money to how do we serve our customers better? It could revolutionize the way we approach our daily task of trying to build our businesses. Great advice from an incredibly passionate and innovative man. This week, I want to share with you a book that is probably on the bookshelves of most of the Fortune 500 CEOs. It's called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. 2,500 years ago, let me say that again, 2,500 years ago, 
Sun Tzu wrote this classic book of military strategy based on Chinese warfare and military thought. Since that time, all levels of military and the business world have used the teachings in warfare and have adapted these teachings for use in politics, business, and everyday life. The Art of War is a book which should be used to gain advantages over your opponents in the boardroom, against your competition, and in other facets of life. It will teach you to conquer your opponents and gain a loyal following of fans and customers. Beyond its military and intelligence applications from earliest days to the present time, again, 2,500 years ago, this book has been applied to many fields well outside of the military. Much of the text is about how to fight wars without having to ever do battle. It gives tips on how to outsmart your opponent so that physical battle is just not necessary. Many companies make this book required reading for their key executives and I have personally turned to it for inspiration and advice on how to succeed in competitive business situations. The Art of War can undoubtedly give you some food for thought when designing your so-called attack strategy when it comes to finding your own blue ocean. You can find this book as well as many other great reads at powermarketing101.com slash hotlist. That's powermarketing101.com slash hotlist. Time for Cooking Corner with Mish. Yum! Now it's time for Cooking Corner with Mitch, where I share with you a tantalizing recipe that you can try at home this week. Today's recipe comes directly from my love of snacking before the actual meal begins, which is why I call them appetizers. Just a little snack to hold us over. I'm not sure who invented the snack, but I think they should win some sort of award for making my stomach happy nearly every single day of my life. We are going to be making artichoke heart, sun-dried tomato, and feta cheese stuffed mushrooms. One of my favorite foods is mushrooms. They're super simple to cook and lend such a beautiful flavor to whatever dish you might be making. You can have crab stuffed, spinach stuffed, bacon stuffed, sausage stuffed, blue cheese stuffed, lasagna stuffed, or just about anything else that you can stuff in or press inside of a mushroom. To start, de-stem about 12 medium-sized mushrooms that you can find at your local grocery store. Or if you want to make this a bit more of a ritzy, elegant affair, go ahead and get five or six portobello mushrooms that will give the dish a much meatier texture. A good mushroom is almost like eating a really good steak. So in a bowl, combine one 14-ounce can of artichoke hearts, one cup of sun-dried tomatoes, or if you don't have that, just dice up one Roma tomato in nice little quarter inch tidbits, one cup of feta cheese, half cup of cream cheese, go ahead and microwave it for about 30 seconds so it's nice and mooshable. Is that a word? I don't know. Two tablespoons of roasted garlic minced up in small pieces or a half a tablespoon of granulated garlic. Salt and pepper to taste and the secret ingredient, a triple batch of love which is something that I've always included with my cooking, no matter what I'm cooking. Now, I used to do just a double batch in my recipes, but people complained that there just wasn't enough love. So one day, I actually tried a quadruple batch of love. Pulled a hamstring, way too much love. So now I just include that triple batch with every dish I make. And remember my rule for the amount of ingredients you put in any of these recipes. If you like something, add more. If you don't, add less. There's no right or wrong way to cooking. That's why I use the ish method. One cup of cheese, ish. More if you like it, less if you don't. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees. Throw those mushrooms on a pie sheet and start stuffing away. Cook for 8 to 10 minutes, giving them a quick look at about the 5 minute mark just to make sure that your mushrooms are cooking along perfectly. Now you don't want to overcook the mushrooms. You don't want them to be mush. You want them kind of al dente. So keep one eye on the mushrooms and the other eye on the beautiful outdoors. Give them a try. Let me know how you like them. Well, that will do it for this edition of Business Edge Radio. My parting shot today is this. People often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, 
neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. <laughs> Zig Ziglar. Until next time, this is Mitch Graff reminding you to live with passion. I'll catch you later. Thanks for hanging out with Business Edge Radio. If you enjoyed today's show, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review. Then hop on over to www.mitchgraff.com to get even more meat and potatoes. We also invite you to follow the show at facebook.com slash unleashed tribe. The most valuable asset that any of us has is our time. And we thank you for choosing to spend some of your precious time with us. 